I'm so happy that we're having this conversation and that this is happening. So I wanna give you all just a little bit of uh, introduction to Theo and Sabrina, but then to just get right into what I think is gonna be a really good chat. So uh, Theo Balcom, class of 09, um, created The Daily at The New York Times. Such a huge deal, right? Um, and under her leadership, it grew to an audience of over four million listens a day, won a DuPont award, and was part of multiple times Pulitzer Prize winning submissions. She also brought the daily to over 200 public radio stations. If you worked in public radio, you know that that took a lot of work <laughs> and um, a lot of relationships. Um, and before the daily, she was a supervising producer of All Things Considered at NPR, the youngest person to hold that role. Uh, Sabrina Tavernisi, class of 93, started at the New York Times in Moscow in 2000 and spent her first 10 years as a foreign correspondent based in Russia, Iraq, Pakistan, and Turkey, where she was the Istanbul bureau chief. In Iraq, she covered civilian casualties and documented the lives of ordinary Iraqis from 2003 to 2007, and it was one of the first to identify sectarian cleansing in 2005. In, tw in 2010, she became a national correspondent for the Times, covering demographics, and was the lead writer for the Times on the census, capturing major demographic shifts underway in the US, including in mortality and fertility, race and ethnicity, things I think we're gonna talk about today. It's a lot of very hard beats. <laughs> so, um, and again, my name is Ambreen and I direct the Athena Center. Um, so, Theo, I wanna go back to the beginning, but not the like beginning, beginning Barnard part, the beginning yeah, yeah. of the, of the daily. Yes. Um, I feel like the best ideas are the things where you're like, how did that not already exist? Right. And so it seems like such an obvious thing today. Was it obvious when you pitched it? Like, how did you pitch it? How did that go? Yeah, so when I was working at All Things Considered, I felt like we're doing really good work. We are trying to put out the best news possible. We're busting our butts to do it every day. And the only way that you could hear it was to be in your car from four to six in the afternoon. <laughs> and <laughs> nobody I knew was doing that. Um, and when I was uh, supervising producer of the show, um, my friends kept calling me being like, do you know the show Serial? <laughs> There's this thing podcasting, it seems really cool. Um, why aren't you doing that? And I was like, well, I am doing that. You just aren't hearing it because it's not available whenever you want it. So that's when the sort of marrying of audio journalism, like we were doing on the broadcast radio, sparked this idea to marry that with something you could access anytime. And so, yeah, so it did seem pretty obvious, I thought. And I went and started talking about it with NPR folks, and I thought this would be really fun to try. Let's do it. And instead, people were like, no, 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 no. Podcasts, they need to be evergreen. They need to last forever. You work so long on podcasts. You should be able to listen to them for years to come. If you make something that expires in a day, nobody will want to listen to that because it won't be relevant anymore after a few hours. So there was a lot of pushback uh, to this concept that you would make something that would, that would kind of maybe not be relevant six hours later. Um, which is funny now because everybody has a daily show, uh, which is very satisfying for me. Um, but yeah, exactly. But anyway, so yeah, so the Times decided they wanted to start an audio team. And I was like, that's cool because nobody was doing that. What is this, a print publication starting an audio team? That's interesting. And so I went to them and I said, listen, I think the first thing I would do if I were to run this department is to start a daily show. And they were like, great. So that's how it happened. <laughs> <laughs> so how many no's um, before you got to that yes? Uh, so NPR didn't want to do it. Um, I didn't like, pay, it wasn't like I was like going around town telling the Washington Post, do this or whatever. Um, it was more like there was just a vibe of this is not what podcasting is for. And people within NPR and people within radio, I think, just didn't think that a daily thing was the right thing to do. Um, because of the level of investment and because of the listener appetite, you know, people thought like you'd come in weekly for a show or every couple, you know, days a month or something. And so, so, you know, one of our concerns was it would be like your New Yorker article, like you would have your New Yorker stack that like stresses you out. It would be like, oh my God, my podcast feed is piling up and I'm not caught up. Um, that, another, that is a real feeling. That was, I just, no, hundred <laughs> percent. But I think, you know, what we were lucky enough to make was not something that you let linger. It was something that you wanted to consume right away. And even if you didn't, it was the kind of reporting that would still be relevant more than six hours later. 
Yeah, so a, a little bit of an aside about cereal is, um, so. Oh God, we could have a whole panel just I know, we that. totally yeah. could. I just feel like we have to talk about it because of this week. Um, but so Rabia Chaudhary was a friend and she called me and said, you know, like, it's finally gonna happen, it's gonna be a show and it's gonna be on This American Life, but it's gonna be like a bunch of episodes. And I was like, it doesn't work that way. Like they don't right. do a bunch of episodes. Like, this is gonna Anand be on this Syed's friend who then pitched the, exactly, yeah. his story to, to This American Life. And, and so she was telling me it was gonna be this like serialized thing and there were gonna be a bunch of episodes. And I was like, but they just don't do that. They do like these evergreen stories that are, you know, like a part of the This American Life episode. I don't get what you're talking about. And of course <laughs> um, I was Surprise. wrong, but, yep. uh, but so I do though, want to dig just a little bit deeper into that because I feel like that's a moment we all like many of us I think have had this experience of like I have such a good idea um, and then someone's like but it's actually not and so were right. there moments where you were like okay maybe I'm not onto something or maybe I'm wrong like how yeah how did you push I, that? I, yes and I mean I had those like I have those about the show now like the show is really hard thing to make like I still definitely have this feeling of we are we are sort of make and now Sabrina is is making this kind of impossible thing like it's a really hard thing to make um, but I don't think I no, I don't think I ever doubted that it was a good idea and I think mainly it was because I wanted to make it for my friends like I I, I, I don't say that jokingly like I wanted yeah I wanted my friends <laughs> to listen to the, the work I was making I mean I, you know some of the work I think of journalism is a little ego right like I I wanted people to to listen to my work and so how could I do that in a way that um, they could get to it that wasn't just broadcast like that that I just felt very firmly that that was the right thing yeah I think I mean that feels really powerful that you if you know who you're making it for what you're doing something for you can push past a lot of the naysayers because it's like you might just not understand it and I there's always that balance of like how much time do I spend convincing you or do I go yeah. where it's wanted and I think it's amazing that it ended up at the times and I'm sure there's some NPR folks kicking themselves but um, amazing that it ended up there and so um, Sabrina, now that the show's like five years in, right? I am curious about what it feels like as a co-host. Like, what is the day like? And specifically, I want to know when you sleep, but how does that work? What is the day like and when do I sleep? Those are, um, yeah, good questions. Thank you guys, everybody, for coming, by the way. It's very nice of you. <laughs> it's a Friday. Yeah, it's you could be doing so other much. things. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the show is, you know, it's an extremely hard thing to make because it is essentially a magazine piece done in a day. Right. And anybody who's ever tried to do a magazine piece knows that it's not just like, you know, I, so I've worked in the New York Times for 22 years, so I spent a lot of time in daily news. And daily news is you dump the most imp four most important things in the top of the story, and then you chuck some stuff at the end of the story, and you're done. <laughs> and you grab a beer. And a magazine is different. Mm -hmm. A magazine is, you know, how do we tell a story with a little bit, with, with, with tension, with facts that you're withholding because you want the mm -hmm. person to come along with you, mm -hmm. um, and with something kind of bigger to say at the end. And, and we're doing that every single day, which is extremely hard. Mm -hmm. So we spend a lot of time sorting through which pieces, which kind of ideas even, uh, or which stories um, out there in the world, and specifically which stories in the New York Times we want to make as episodes. And a lot of them don't work, because a lot of, I think, daily journalism in a newspaper is, um, you know, it's sort of a quick hit of news. It's right. not Incremental. deep. Yeah. It's not, it doesn't give you a real sense of, you know, um, uh, you know, a real understanding of an issue, I think. I think it's a lot of, you know, if you, if you dip into a, a daily news story in the newspaper, you oftentimes don't, and you're uninitiated to the mm -hmm. topic, you oftentimes okay. can't really figure out what the heck is going on because it's a lot of very small, you know, details that the reporter is hazing you with and you just kind of <laughs> feel like I need a step back to understand what this is and that's what the daily does. In fact, I was using it myself. I mean, I was a, you know, I was a huge fan of the show and also, um, I was a, an avid user because there's so many things out there in the world you can't keep up with. Mm. And I remember, you know, headlines skittering by, I'm trying to think of, I mean, you know, not the financial crisis. I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, you know, oh, I know, this is actually recent. Um, now I'm admitting to you guys that I did not follow this on a daily basis, so don't tell anybody. Um, <laughs> the, the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial, mm. I was like, oh God. Mm. But then I thought, the daily should do it because I want someone with a kind of a thoughtful 
deep treatment of this. Right. I don't have time to keep up with it in my daily life. Right. Right. I think probably culturally it's important. Yeah. I kind of wish I had time, but I don't. If yeah. I could take a vitamin pill and suddenly understand it, I would do that. But that vitamin pill is mm -hmm. the daily. Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, I think that's why people love it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why it's so downloaded. That's why it's so beloved. But it is also why it is incredibly difficult to make. And so, you know, sleeping, I don't sleep that much. <laughs> I mean, is it, is it like, can you do this forever then? Like, how does that, how does the, no, I, I really mean We're this, going right? There. Like, yeah. how, what's the, how, what's the sustainability of this and you? I mean, I think it should, you know, we're kind of, we, the Daily just hired a new um, executive producer who is great, who came from This American Life, who's, you know, creative, very creative person um, and ran a big radio station in Chicago. So I think that like, we're kind of, I know Theo's like, maybe has a kind of bitter hollow laugh when I say we're reaching sustainability. <laughs> Really, um, but you know, I think um, it's getting better. Yeah. It's getting better, and I think it's you know the team is bigger. We can you know we turned around on a day you know in in the course of a 24-hour period two obits of two major 20th century leaders um, mm -hmm. when Michael was on paternity leave, so that was challenging. <laughs> Gorbachev and the Queen, um, you know, but like we're we just throw ourselves at mostly the news every single week and we have to be very flexible because you know when Gorbachev dies at 7 p.m. on a Thursday night you're making That's Friday's straight. episode all night. Yeah I also think you guys have more of a challenge actually than we did in the first uh, an old boss of mine refers to the the Trump administration years of the daily as the first season so mm -hmm. so in the first season yeah. um, it was a lot clearer a lot of the time what story we actually should do yeah. and now you know because we launched two months two months after Trump was inaugurated, so there were all those executive orders, and then James Comey was fired, and then yeah. Hurricane Maria happened, and then the Russia investigation. So it was like the first year or two, it was it was clearer a lot of the time. Yeah. This is the thing that should be the story, which is yeah. sometimes the hardest part. Yeah. Um, and now you have a much bigger challenge of there's not as much uh, clarity about what the biggest story in yeah. the country is. Um, so you yeah. have more of a more of an uphill battle, I think. Yeah, no, it's, it, is, it is quite hard. And we, we think really hard about what do we want to bother people with, right. you know? Like we, we don't want to give them every single thing that's in the news because that's not why you listen to the show. Right. I mean, we as journalists, I have um, an old boss always used to say, and this is sort of not that, it's kind of an obvious thing, but you know, we're hired for our judgment. Mm -hmm. Like we weigh things and we decide this is the important thing. Uh, and, and we will place it in front of you so that you will be able to understand this. Uh, we're making a judgment about that. I mean, it's a little bit like the front page of the New York Times. A lot of people think really hard about which are kind of the big stories of the day. And sometimes people disagree with them, mm -hmm. or sometimes I disagree with them, but you know, it's, it's ultimately a set of judgments that you, that I think a busy person, a busy person who wants to be informed kind of wants someone curating. That's, you know, that's, that's, anyway. Yeah, right. You don't want to add to the noise. Like that was a right. big, focus of ours was there's so much wildness and craziness happening and a lot of yelling <laughs> like let's let's veer away from that right like let's give you something that feels deep and thoughtful and measured yeah and help you understand things right. so in the conversations that you're having about like what are we doing tomorrow how often is it like oh it's obvious that we're doing you know, Gorbachev tomorrow or whatever. Mm -hmm. And how, how many times are you all like not exactly on the same page about what it would be? I think, because mm, I do feel like you're right that in the Trump years, it was like so obvious, like this is the thing we have to talk about tomorrow. But I don't know that that feels as true now. I think we often have lots of back and forths now. I mean, I'd say 50%, I mean, I'd say 30% of the time we're saying, are you sure that should be tomorrow? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we usually, hopefully have tomorrow figured out by this morning, but sometimes we don't. Mm -hmm. And you know, and sometimes tomorrow changes at 4 p.m. today. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's that because it is fundamentally the news business. But, um, you know, I've been trying to kind of push us in a little bit more in the direction of having more international news. You know, I come from a background where I lived in Russia for a long time. I lived uh, in Turkey. I, wa I want us to have, I want our listeners to understand more about the world. And I understand that like in the Trump era, it was you know, very much kind of the US was sort of like um, blowing up and, and things had gone crazy here. But I think that you know, now we can, I think we should be doing, for instance, which we haven't done, 
the European energy crisis. <laughs> so I'm like, they're like, oh, EU, so boring. And everyone, no one wants to do the European energy crisis. And I'm like, guys, it's the second most important story in the world right now. We're not doing it. That's bad. Like, I think listeners should know about Germany and the pipelines. And yes, it might be a little bit boring, but like, you got to eat your broccoli sometimes. And like, I'm like, I'm like the broccoli lady on the show. <laughs> I love that broccoli is always the example because yeah. my kid actually loves it. Oh, really? So, yeah, so, so it doesn't quite work for us. Um, <clears throat> but uh, speaking about the shows that you said, you know, sometimes it just doesn't work. Like, what are those? What are the things that don't work for the daily? You know, you have to be able to have a thoughtful conversation for 25 minutes with someone on a yeah. topic. It's and actually a long time. <clears throat> it is a long time. And, and sometimes people say, you know, there's, there's enough, to, you know, sometimes we, we, we kind of, talk to a reporter, we call it the, the pre-interview, you know, we'll sit down and we'll have, or at this point it's kind of on video most of the time, mm -hmm. but we'll, we'll start asking them questions and I mean truly like you're interviewing someone, you're kind of probing around figuring out is there an insight here, is there something that we're, we can kind of tell people that would surprise them or really help crystallize what's going on here. And um, you know, and often there isn't. I mean, particularly with daily newspaper yeah. news, it's it's you think, okay, well, you know, um, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, ugh, guys, I'm not coming armed with examples. <laughs> um, anyway, I think oftentimes, you know, a simple newspaper story is not enough to make an episode because there's just simply not enough to say. Because you, you know, and, and people and the reporter will say, you know, you know, I could talk about this for seven minutes, but 25, no, that it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's too incremental or it's just, I don't have the depth in it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of what I really enjoy about it is that it's, it's just conversation. And so it's like, in my mind, almost like the anti-radio lab, like there's no like, ping, ping, like all this stuff happening. <laughs> well, there's, there's, right? there's pings and pongs too. So yeah, but, there's, <laughs> but there's way less, yeah, right? Yeah. So I feel like I'm not actually listening for the, the like, sound engineering mm -hmm. as much as I'm listening just for the depth of the conversation. Mm. And so I feel like we kind of actually just did this right now where, mm. you know, I'm just an eavesdropper mm. on a conversation you're having, mm -hmm. having, and that's the kind of vibe mm -hmm. of the daily. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, because you two are together mm -hmm. now, like what is the conversation that mm -hmm. you want to have with each mm -hmm. other? Theo, how did you survive? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things that People want to have sort of answers about like, we, you know, we solved daily news, right? Like we, yeah. we came to some kind of conclusion that was like, this is how you should do it. Um, and what I'm doing now, I, I left the Times last fall and I went out to sort of make my own company of one and now I'm working with other um, media organizations making other audio shows. Um, and people want me to be like, okay, fix this. Mm. Um, and I think that the thing that I've, come to is that there's not really, we haven't reached any answers, right? Like we're just asking the same questions over and over again and each time we're getting a little bit better. Yeah. Like we're realizing at 7 p.m. when we have to do the Gorbachev <coughs> thing, that's not as hard as it was yeah. last year that time because yeah. we've landed a little bit more on we have a format or we have a reporter or we have a relationship or we've done a source interview that we opened in this kind of way and it worked really well. So let's try yeah. that again. Um, like one of the things that is the delicate dance of the show that I experienced was let's nail down what we're actually doing. So we're not reinventing the wheel every day, yeah. but also let's screw it up every day. <laughs> like let's always be making it new. And so I think you're in a really, cool time where like you have that foundation but you can also now f it up like you can you can you can keep making it different and so i i wonder how much you feel like you can do that and what that might look like um because because my whole thing was like let's always be innovating let's just like yeah. not fall into a groove and it's harder now because there's so many other people who are trying to do what yeah, we're doing. Yeah. Um, so I think it's cool, actually, that you said you don't hear a ton of production in it because that yeah, is a lot the, like, of work. Layer, right? Yes, yeah. that layer of work of production is so hard, and not to be snobby about it, but like you hear it on other shows. Mm. Like you hear it when that cue, that music isn't quite right, right? Like it comes in a little <laughs> too soon or a little too loud, or like you hear some random bit of newsreel and you're like, wait, what? Why did that come in? Like. That, that is the invisible work that we're doing. But um, anyway, yeah, I don't know. I was just thinking about how, at this stage, how you think about doing the show now and next. Yeah, you guys invented it. Yeah, it's amazing what you did. Oh, 
Thank you. So I think, you know, I think the show is definitely, I mean, obviously, as we keep saying now, tiresomely, it takes a lot of work to make, but, um, you know, we've mastered that form. I think I personally love it when the show is able to do interviews with ordinary people. Um, yeah. And I have been trying to kind of, um, you know, push us to do more of that. I mean, not that we need pushing, but um, it's just very hard to organize in the course of everything else that's yep. going on. Um, and they're a little bit, you know, riskier because it's not a colleague that you tell, you know, this is kind of, you know, we're trying to arrange right. your thoughts here in a way that people will understand. Uh, and you can't just like hit me with a machine gun with 25 thoughts all at <laughs> once. It's not gonna work. No right. one will be able to understand you. And trying um, to find mm -hmm. one person who can kind of encapsulate yeah. the story you're trying to tell. Yeah which nobody can, right? So being yeah. ma making sure that you're like, okay, we're picking off this slice of it, right? Yeah. We're not telling the whole of this particular beat. We're just gonna tell this person's story. Yeah, or so I guess, I guess I, I'm thinking of a couple of different things we've done. Um, one was, um, I, I basically, when the Americans were talking about how, um, you know, the, the Putin was going to invade Ukraine, I was seeing this news, I'm an old Russia correspondent, so I was kind of reading about it sort of nerdily and obsessively. And I told the Daily, I said, you know, I think we should we should go. I mean, I have skills, I can speak mm. Russian. Like, mm. I, this is my, I spent a lot of time doing conflict reporting as well. Mm. So for me, it was a sort of weird co kind of convergence of two things I'd done forever in my professional career. And, um, and to their credit, they said, hmm, okay, yeah. why don't you go? Yeah. Um, Which is I, huge, like we never left the studio. <laughs> like, yeah. we, like we never went anywhere. Oh my God, but the, it's like, I feel like there were all these like amazing, talented, like Brooklyn podcasters with their huge things on and they were like, wait, what, go there? I was like, yeah, like go there, like, like go there, like get on a yeah. plane. And then I was yeah. like, guys, by the way, if we don't get on a plane in the next 48 hours, You're we will have going. to drive overland for like three weeks because they're right. gonna close the airspace. So we, we need to decide this right now. Yeah. And they were like, okay. okay. <laughs> um, and, um, and I was actually, oh my God, it was a weird story because I was supposed to go with two producers and um, one, um, had a positive pregnancy test the night before we were supposed to fly out Ooh. and said, probably I shouldn't be going. <laughs> I mean, she wanted to, but we were like, oh, uh, you know, boy. probably not a great idea. And the other said at the last minute, I don't, I, you know, will there be bombing? And I was like, yeah. yes, it's a war. Yeah. She was like, I'm yeah. not going. Yeah. So I went by myself and I didn't yeah. really know how to do it. I mean, I was like. So you just like got your kit, you got your recorder, you got your mic and you're like, I'm gonna go cover this. I had a little Zoom thing with a little like fluffy thing so that it wouldn't like <laughs> you know, sound bad in the wind. There are more and technical it, terms for these things. <laughs> but yes. okay. Exactly, I don't know any of them. I was like, <laughs> oh my God, this is crazy. So, you know, but I knew conflict. Right. And I knew right. Russia. And I knew the New York Times. So I felt like, right. you know, I had a of lot course. of things going for me. So right. I would, but I also, but I really didn't know audio. So in, in the beginning, I was just, you know, walking around with my recorder. In the, in the, I love this. And the Brooklyn podcasters yeah. were like, um, Serena, we don't speak Russian. We don't understand what anyone is saying. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, good point. Right, true. Okay, true. So, so then I was just starting to like, so we had a time zone difference, obviously, because I was seven hours ahead and um, they were in New York. And it was, you know, my evening my time by the time anyone even woke up or kind of could see all the files that I sent. And then there was just not enough time mm. at physically mm. to actually like go through and help them and translate mm. for them and stuff. Mm. And, and so I just started to just translate in the course of having conversations mm. with people, which was, you know, time consuming, but basically worked. And I mean, ugh, my Russian's a little rusty. My husband was like, oh my God, you're, this is irresponsible. You should not be, <laughs> you're like, you know, you're like, 10 years out of date, and you, but it was fine. It came back and it was, and it was a lot of it was, sure. you know, very, um, you know, raw because right. it was people leaving their homes. It was people who, you know, whose husbands were going to war. It was um, people who had nothing and were holding their two-year-old in the train station. Um, and, and I just, I felt, I don't know, it's amazing kind of the, I felt like, like I felt like audio was, I felt like I was flying. I was like, 
this is exactly what I want to be doing. You were in the right place at the right time and you knew it. You had that like gut instinct. You were like, I'm going. And this is the magic, right? So this is why the New York Times is the place to do this because you weren't going and being like, okay, I got to set up my little audio scene and I have to book <laughs> my person and I have to get my perfect sound equipment and whatever. Right. You were in the act of reporting yep. and that's what we heard. Yeah. It wasn't orchestrated and performative, yeah. right? Like I think what you're saying about listening in on a conversation, we never in the course of the show say, so listener, Sabrina was on the streets of Ukraine and you'll remember that last week she was in Russia. Like we just talk in an organic way to each other yeah. and then you get to hear it. So it's not, it's not put on, yeah. right? So you were just doing the thing that you know how to do yeah. and getting the story from the people who are experiencing it. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it really felt like, I mean, again, having been a print reporter for the New York Times for 22 years, you know, and I've covered, I was covering the war in Iraq and, and, and um, various other conflicts. And it, you're having to do, you know, scrambling around and you're sort of writing a news story every single time there's a bombing. And it's just a lot of like the incremental stuff that I was talking about. And I felt like, but you have to keep up with news kind of, mm. it's relentless. Mm. But this was mm -hmm. such freedom because mm. it was like, I wanted people to feel like they were actually there mm. in the train station. Mm. And I thought like, it was just like the creative challenge of figuring out how to do that yeah. and how to have conversations with people that like brought them to a place emotionally where they were like, this is what it feels like to be a middle-class mm. person who was just taking their kid to school and soccer practice mm -hmm. yesterday, who now doesn't have a house. Mm. And like, and it's, you, when you hear the voice, right. it's crazy. It's like something in the rap brain connects and like you have an emotional <laughs> response and it's so much more powerful. I mean, it's a little a cliche, but it really is. Like, I don't know, it was like a revelation to me. Yeah, have you found that, that the reaction to the stories that you, the audio stories that you do is markedly different from your print stories? Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah. in what They're, way? They just, you know, people really respond in this like very, very, I mean, we were just were dump trucked with, um, in a, like the best way with like listener emails. Like, oh my God, yeah, you know, what yeah. happened to little Tim? Cause I did this whole thing, which I was trying to send you guys, but I messed up the clip, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, this little refugee kid who was sitting on this pile of suitcases in a, uh. a different train station, it was like, just so sweet, you mm. know? And like, like the weird way that kids' brains think Mm. when they're in like a war situation. Like mm. he was like, I mean, we were speaking in Russian, but he had this little Lego thing he was playing with. And he said, um, he, he said, he kept asking, how, what was he asking? How do you translate? And then the name of his city, mm. like, cause he was fascinated that I spoke English and I was trying to mm. kind of speak English to him at first. His name was Tim, he was like nine. And he said, um, I think it was Kiev and I was in Lviv. He said, how do you translate Kiev? And I said, it's just Kiev, mm. and he said, because that's where the, the last time I saw my dad, like he, he just was like, mm. his brain was just free associating, but mm. in this like, I don't know, you can't talk to kids directly about war, you just kind of have to play right. Legos with them and eventually something comes out. But anyway, so it just felt very, um, yeah. like I was so, I wanted people to hear that. Right, and that interaction is the thing that if we were in old public radio land, we would have been like, that's too slow. Like, that's very sweet and endearing, but like we don't have time in the four and a half minute story that we're making to actually keep this in. But that yeah. back and forth is so telling, right? We're showing you yeah. this effect of war in a way that, yeah, the rap, I like the rap brain thing that mm -hmm. connects to the rap mm -hmm. brain. <laughs> Um, and that, folks, is me playing the invisible audio engineer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll edit it later. It'll sound. It better. took a lot not to interrupt and ask all the things I wanted to ask. Um, but but I really, it's it's exciting to see things that I think are moving really fast. And you're right, it's a totally different stage yeah. of something that you launch and you're trying to make happen, and then now you're at a different place. And so the idea that you never left the studio, like I totally get it. Right. And the, and you can't possibly not leave the studio now because right. there right. is yeah. so much out there that I think um, is important. And so I, I appreciate hearing that. Yeah. So I would love to know what you think like makes it really special, right? Like what do you, what what is working about it? Like what's the magic? How would you describe that? I mean, I think audio in general, it's it's the the hearing from 
Tim and that scene in sort of its entirety. I think it's also, I think it's interesting you were talking about source interviews in particular. I think yeah. that it's being able to go deep with somebody in their personal story in a way that isn't, um, that is hopefully not extractive that makes sense like one of the focuses that we really had and I, I know I'm sure it's carried on is is that you don't start your interview saying so Sabrina tell me about the worst day of your life right you start the <laughs> interview with like oh so where'd you grow up and mm -hmm. what'd your parents do and do you have any siblings and right you you get to know the people that you're hearing on the show in a richer way rather than just going in, and they have to do this on Morning Edition, right? They have to just, they have so little time, and they just intro, they're like, okay, joining us now from the war zone is Tim. Tim, what are you seeing? And what's the worst <laughs> stuff here? Like, He's like, I got this Lego thing. Right? <laughs> like, wow, well, God. Steve, um, so, so I think that, that, that like, that's, a, that's an audio power thing, and that's something that we really harness. And, um, and you know, combining that with, like, you know, the reporting that you do and the colleagues you have on, on all the different desks at the, at the paper is like, it's just people living their beats and knowing in yeah. and out exactly what's going on as best as they can tell. And that like depth of knowledge and expertise is just so rare because nobody can afford to do that anymore. Yeah. Like to have a person who is solely covering some of the things that you covered, um, just doesn't really exist. And so the, the fun of my, that job was like, I could call up anybody and be like, I have this crazy idea. <laughs> Is this really what's happening? Do you think we could do this? Could we try that? Could we call up this person? Mm -hmm. And Sabrina would be like, oh yeah, I know like 10 of those people, sure, go for it. Here you go, here are their phone numbers. Um, so I think, I think that's part of, those are off the top of my head, some of the. Some so of talk the a little bit then about the role of emotion, right? Because mm. on, on the one hand, like, I can't understand a story if I can't make a connection with it, like mm. just as a human. But also, like, there's always the risk of a little bit of emotional manipulation, yeah. right? And so, yeah. how are you um, thinking that through? Because you came from print, right? And yeah. it was a very different way of expressing things. And I don't know. It, it feels like you could have these moments where it's like, look at this poor sad child. Like right. now, I'm, right. you know, now I feel connected with this, and and not something else that I read about in print. So, how do you think through, like, how much emotion? Mm. Um, it's a good question. I think I found it much more prevalent in audio generally. I don't know if that's kind of a habit or, or sort of why that is necessarily. I do think it's a better medium to, you know, express emotion. I think that emotion and kind of how we perceive the world is so important and is so hard to get at in print. Um, and that's why one of the reasons I appreciate audio, I mean, um, you know, it's like we're all having kind of emotional responses to things all the time, all day long. And, um, and, and that relates to kind of how we see things. And sometimes it's really different than how other people see things. Um, and, um, <laughs> this is my brain is sorry. This is a slight tangent, but I'll bring it around. Um, it's reminding me of, um, you know, I think in a lot of ways, the Trump era kind of had, you know, like there was this undercurrent of emotion kind of going through it. And if you were reporting without taking it into account at all, you would just completely miss the mm -hmm. point. Yeah. I remember being questioned by um, an editor who will remain nameless, <laughs> not at the Daily, this is before <laughs> I came to the Daily, who was, um, I was on uh, in DC on January 6th, and I had been going mm. to the, I'd been going to the Trump rallies actually after the election, because I was like, I, you know, I covered foreign places, you know, in like different countries that had been, had a lot of conflict problems, and like once you start talking about kind of elections being stolen, it's a huge problem for political systems, so I was kind of interested in like watching that. And so I happened to be, I was in the Capitol on January 6th, and, mm. um, and I remember I was like, I had gotten up really early because everyone had driven from like rural Wisconsin and wherever to um, be in, in DC and uh, to the Ellipse or whatever. And um, I was, I had been all morning kind of talking to people, interviewing them, and then just feeding quotes to the, you know, the editor on duty. And, 
And at some point I, in the morning, kind of mid-morning, I looked at the, the story on my phone and I was like, wow, none of my people are in this hmm. piece that's running online. And I called the editor, I was like, what's going on? Like, I've yeah. been working for like five hours, I see nothing. And he said, um, Sabrina, I mean, these people are all, you know, this is all fantasy. <gasps> we are not a platform for fantasists. Whoa. And I, and I remember saying, do you understand what's going on out here? Like, it basically, yes. It sounds like a fantasy to you, but like, you know, like, it is very real to them. And like, you know, it's, it's about perception. Like, like, like basically, you know, war. When, you, when you're in a war, right, and you, you're interviewing different sides in a conflict, um, they have completely different sets of facts. But you have to understand them. You have to understand them in order to be able to be like, diagnose the problem. Yeah. And if you're just saying like, la, 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 like, which is basically no, what that no, editor no, no, was no, doing. No. I mean, it's, it's journalistically very difficult. It's very challenging, right? Because yeah. in some sense he's right. You don't yeah. want to just be like, have the guy spouting off yeah. just complete banana stuff and yeah. not kind of put it into context. But, but you also kind of need to know what your countrymen are saying. And I feel like it was, that was a real, this, yeah, sorry, this yeah. is now kind of no, gone. No, this no, this is I mean, yeah. I'm fascinated by it. Yeah. Also, I think I can say this, maybe you don't, you, uh, you can chime in if you want to. But I think that this is one of the things that we have on the daily such a privilege of, which is that like, we would, we, those quotes would make our episode. Yes, exactly, exactly. And in fact, right? I always thought like, oh, the daily would run this. I remember yeah. thinking like, oh, the daily is much more eclectic than the paper is. The paper's yeah. like, no, no, we must. Yeah, it, and we would contextualize it, of course, but yeah. like, it, we just have the ability to program ourselves in a way that doesn't have to necessarily align with the newsroom. I mean, we're not yeah. we're not like going outside the bounds of t too far, but we just have such a privilege because we're just kind of over on our own side, yeah. like doing our own thing. And in the beginning, like nobody was listening. I mean, you all were listening, but the, <laughs> the editors aren't listening. So, so we could just kind of do what we wanted. Totally. And that that makes I mean that makes me happy. That, that's why I think obviously you should be doing this work, right? Cause like you get to then delve deeper into that. And that's yeah. why I think we worked together a lot um, before you were co-host because it was like your beats and the things that you were doing and the people you were talking to yeah. were understanding and tapping into those feelings when we felt like we couldn't get at that in other ways. And yeah. like you were able to find those, those voices and those stories in such a powerful way for the show. Uh, and there's real power in being um, the people that no one is thinking about. Yeah. I feel like I've like aimed for that a little bit in yeah. a lot of my jobs. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. How do I be off to the side so that like I'm not causing problems for right. you, right. but like I can be a little bit experimental. And yeah. so it, it's cool to be that kind of the innovation team within a larger yeah. institution that actually has like reach and resources. So, yes. I mean, that's amazing. Yes. Um, so I have absolutely no idea what time it is. <laughs> and I did not bring my watch and I Porter. don't. Oh, shit. Okay. So, sorry. <laughs> um, so, I feel like I'm going to ask my last question okay. and then we should turn it Great. over to folks. Um, and truly, sorry, I just, I figured my, my watch would keep buzzing the entire time <laughs> otherwise. Um, I really want to know Barnard in your story. And I know that you, um, and I'll, a little context to this question is when Theo and I were chatting a couple weeks ago, she was like, so in this feminist Marxism class I took at the Brooklyn Museum, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, that's the most Barnard alum thing you could possibly say. Um, and so maybe this is more a question for Sabrina yeah. a few more years out, like yeah. where does Barnard show up for yeah. you still? So, so I was just saying to Umbreen and to Theo that I'm class of 93, and Barnard was huge in my life and still is because three of my closest friends in the world uh, I w went, to went to Barnard with and lived with um, in 620, which I don't even know if that's still... still right there. <laughs> um, 620 for, fans. Yeah. I think it, it may also look the same. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I mean, it was okay. It was okay. Um, but no, it was great. It was great. And, and yeah, my closest friends in the world are, st are, you know, these are still my closest friends in the world. I mean, these are where I've formed my primary relationship, which my, my husband um, was, grew up in the UK and he has uh, the opposite. He has his high school friends are the closest mm. and I don't have basically any yeah. high school friends, but my Barner friends are absolutely the closest. I met them on the first day of college. Mm. Um, and we, yeah, we just, uh, gosh, there've been, we've been through so many things together. Um, and you know, it's, it's funny, it's like there's real meaning in 
in friendships that go back a long time, because it's someone who says like, you know, who can kind of a little bit gut check you, like, you know, remember, you know, what you were complaining about 20 years ago. <laughs> Just kind of remind you kind of like yeah. who you were and, and, and um, I value those friendships so much. I really do. Um, and I'm grateful to Barnard. I actually, um, I don't, I've never really talked about this before, but I, I think, I guess I was in my first year at Barnard in 1993. 1989, oh my goodness, sorry guys. <laughs> um, and my dad lost his job, actually. And, um, you know, even back then, Barnard was like, I mean, for our family, Barnard was quite expensive. So I was thinking, like, preparing to have to, you know, I was gonna go to the, I'm from Massachusetts, University of Massachusetts, or like some, some other place. And um, I was gonna transfer. And then they, um, just like financial aid wise, upped my financial aid so that I didn't have to leave mm. Barnard, which was amazing. Mm. I mean, they, you know, I still had loans and stuff, mm -hmm. but um, it was kind of incredible. So I am so grateful for that. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And um, for the first years in the room, um, if you didn't meet your best friends on the first day of college, it's still going to happen. So I <laughs> want you to know that because I spent a long time during orientation saying, don't worry about it. So you will meet them. Um, and there's also that kind of Barnard thing, right? Of like, Oh, that's why I really liked you. Uh -huh. No, so that's what happened totally. with this. Like, um, President Bylock emailed me and was like, so you and Sabrina, you could come and do this event. I was like, wait, Sabrina? Sabrina? Sabrina went to Barnard! <laughs> <laughs> it's all making sense! <laughs> and Theo and I met um, at a conference years ago, and I also was like, she seems really cool. And uh, a <laughs> little Googling later solved yeah. it. Uh, yeah. Not that I Googled you after. Um, <laughs> So, uh, any questions from the audience? One right here. And I'll repeat that just um, for the folks on the Zoom. So, uh, how do you consistently capture listeners in like a social media world where mm. we're paying attention to less shorter content, right? Well, one of the funny things what I should have mentioned when I was talking about some of the difficulties I had pitching this project, people said, oh, well, young people like, you know, listicles. And uh, this was like the BuzzFeed years. Um, and you I was like- You just dated yourself with that one. Sorry, <laughs> okay. That's when I was still the young demographic. Um, and so I, so I could say like, no, 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 no. We're just gonna talk to people like they're people. Like we don't have to talk to them like they're young people, uh, and, and it worked out. Um, but I, I don't know, I mean, I think one of the things that we tried to focus on was like, how can we make the beginning of each episode super engaging? Mm -hmm. So how can we kind of hook you, not in a, not in a manipulative way, hopefully, um, but how can we like compel you really quickly so that then you're connected to that person or connected to that reporter? That's why you would have all those funny little moments where reporters were like, oh, where's my Coke Zero or whatever, you know, those, maybe we overdid it a little bit, um, <laughs> but those sort of like transparent human moments um, hopefully connect you right away and then you're like, okay, I'm gonna go on this ride for 30 minutes or whatever. Um, how do you think about it, Sabrina? Oh my gosh, um, I don't know how, do, I think that, I feel like maybe precisely because everything is so short and yeah. micro and everybody is so brain dead from it all, <laughs> that it's a little bit like a long tall, or whatever the thing, you know, it's a tall cold glass of water. I mean, it mm. feels like you mm. kind of just want mm. a whole quiet, yeah you know, kind of intention, intentional, but, but just sort of like you want just kind of a complete thought yeah. um, that you can stay with for a little yeah. bit of time and actually come out the other end feeling like you learned something yeah. as opposed to someone just talking at you, which is like what most other things are, right? Um, yeah, I and I think that's what's special about the daily. Um, and I think, and, and in the answer is like people voted with their feet, right? They wanted it. I mean, <laughs> we right. still have, I mean, it's amazing. You know, you know, it's like between four and $5 million a day um, so it's, um, it shows you that people want that. And I think even in the paper, you know, um, people still, they, people read magazines. I mean, people want, people listen to cereal for God's sakes. I mean, that was, you know, however many episodes of, yeah. you know, long, so, so I, it's not that people don't want depth. Um, 
I mean, maybe the sad truth is they don't really want newspapers. You know, <laughs> they don't want the middle stuff. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm actually the wrong person to talk about yeah. this because I'm not really an audience person. But um, and just in terms of knowing the numbers and knowing what people want and stuff, that's, Theo knows more about this than I do. <clears throat> Thanks for the question. Yeah, I do. I do think it's um, a little bit of a myth, right, that we only want like short content because mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that's absolutely true. But um, what a gift to like deep dive on one thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I always find myself turning off at the here's what else you need to know. <laughs> oh my God, like, do no, not tell not me alone. that because we write this headlines and I've been on a, I have been on a personal quest to kill the headlines. I'm sorry, Theo, who thought? I, I'm with you. I hate I'm them. Not, I'm Does not anyone listen to the headlines? headlines. It's like, you're like no, two minutes before the end sense. of the podcast? It doesn't make any sense. That happened because oh. we were like, we need to have more stories in here, right? And then we realized, I mean, when we started, we were doing two stories, sometimes three stories a day. Which is bananas. Well, bananas. I mean, yeah. And then we were like, okay, pare back, pare back, pare back. And then we said, okay, but we still want it to feel complete in some way, right? Like a whole meal. Um, and so we kept that section. But yes, no, it drives people freaking crazy. I mean, on the team yeah. making it. And and, there, and we, do, we do see a drop. No, I mean, You're not when alone. you say, here's what else you need to know, the answer for me is nothing. I know <laughs> what, that's it. I'm and we, we actually user tested the same concept with a podcast at KQED when I was oh, there. Uh -huh. same, same thing. They, like, too much. Yeah. Right? Like, I want what I want, and I you just, you know. You can use this, Sabrina. You can go back and say. Can you please a write a reader email people. right now? Uh, have so it's actually me. my goal never to write the reader emails that people, these journalists receive, because I think if I write it to you, I basically have to tell you how much I hate your voice, right? No. That's like the women's email. No, you know, weirdly, right? they get a lot of nice ones. Oh, At good. the paper, okay. they were almost universally nerdy, but negative, <laughs> yeah, you know? Yeah, you drop yeah. that comma, and I don't know. I don't know what it is I, about the paper. I might just be following like, a lot of women journalists yeah, on Twitter yeah, yeah, yeah. who are screenshotting emails that they get about how much oh, people hate really? their voice. Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> so, of, oh, well, that's true. There's, there's that. Yeah, that's that. true. Yeah. That's true. So, um, so uh, question from uh, the Zoom, Hannah Lazar. I would love to hear about how the run-up evolved into the daily. Okay, so so backstory for the people for like the non five thousand people or something who listen to the <laughs> like run up. Amazing question. Um, the run up was uh, an elections podcast in twenty sixteen, and it was a a sort of prototype for the daily in the sense that it was interviewing Times journalists about Times stories in a twenty ish thirty ish minute format, hosted by a man named Michael Barbaro. So it, um, it was a really good experiment inside the Times. I should say I came afterwards, so I only know about it from that perspective. But it, it was really well received inside the building because suddenly reporters and editors were like, oh, wow, our people are really good talkers. <laughs> um, and they can go down and record this thing, and then people can hear it. And it was a really good um, thing for Michael, who had never hosted anything before and really had never listened to audio. Like, didn't Were they have... editing? Were they editing it? They... What was Lisa the... Tobin was editing it. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. huh. okay. So the, 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 um, I should say I made the daily with Michael Barbaro, Lisa Tobin, and Andy Mills. It was the four of us together who actually created the sound and the format of the thing in um, 2017. And so one of those editors worked with Michael on the run-up. And, um, and how did it evolve otherwise? I mean, I think it was like, you know, we knew that Maggie Haberman and Michael sounded great together on tape. You know, we knew that, like, the, the journalists would be really game. One of the secrets about the show, why it took off so fast, I think, inside the building is that Michael's just a sweetie. <laughs> and everybody wants to do him a favor. So, so when we would go in, you know, it was just the two of us piloting this thing. And I'd be like, Michael, how are, you know, how are we going to get people to talk to us? This is just not, it's not even going to go out. It's just a pilot. He's like, don't worry about it. And people would just want to come and hang out with him in the studio. Um, so we learned that. And uh, yeah, and then I think, you know, now they've actually, they've retooled it. Estead Herndon is now hosting an elections show who's um, amazing. And I haven't yet listened to it, but they, they're, they're taking the name and running with it again. I love that. Thank you for the little mm -hmm. insider scoop on mm -hmm. that one. Um, so I think I'm supposed to wrap up right now, even <laughs> though I have like 10 million more things I want to ask you. Um, so I just have uh, to say thank you, mm. first of all, for coming like from your work, fitting it in. I thought this might be like when you sleep, 
So um, yeah, right. I know. You know, I know. Uh, when I saw Sabrina, I was like, "Are you working today?" I hope yeah. not. Also, that college cost episode is really good. Mm -hmm. um, thank so, so thank you for taking time and for coming from Maine, where you live yeah, now, right? Yeah. So I, I'm really grateful for that, and just to get to have this conversation with people who I think are driving change in really uh -huh. interesting ways. Um, I have two announcements for everyone. So the first is you got to hear the boring one before the interesting one. So. Um, <laughs> Giving Day is coming up Wednesday, October 26th. <laughs> and um, as Sabrina told you, this was nuts. It's really important. <laughs> and if you are competitive at all, we compete with the other Columbia schools, and we were third last year, and Ooh. I don't want to be third. So I want us to think about how we can achieve the goal, but really, it's literally volume. Like, it's the number of people who give that matters, and there are match gifts, and you know, um, anything we can do to support this institution that we love. So I am just putting it out there, October 26th. There's no way you won't hear about it again. Um, and then my other announcement is just for the students in the room, we have space for probably about 20 folks um, to join in Salzburger Parlor at 215 for just kind of like a casual chat with Theo. So if you are an aspiring podcaster or just want to Talk to, I feel like yeah. you are the Michael Barbaro of here, oh, the sweetie that everybody wants sweet. to talk to. So, um, so it's, I, we'll see how much space there is, but let's fit in and, and have a great student chat. Yeah, and if you can't come, you, you can reach out to me anytime. Like I, I, one, of my, one of my happiest things is getting to talk to Barnard students. So you know, if, you, if you want any advice about anything, audio or regard, whatever, anything else, just reach out. Yeah, I, and I, I think that's a lot of alums are like that, so I encourage people to do it all the time. So thank you to the folks on Zoom watching. Thank you to all thank of you, you for coming. Thank you for coming. Ah.